it really showcases Homer's heart. Uh, and as the show progresses and it becomes a lot more wackier and there's a lot more buffoonery, sometimes Homer's heart gets lost in the noise. Hello, I'm Jack Bacone, host of Worst Episode Ever, a Simpsons podcast. And we are going to talk about every job Homer has ever had in The Simpsons. We're gonna define these jobs as anything Homer's done, paid or unpaid, ranging from his main job at the nuclear power plant to any of the many one-off gags, off-screen references, and whatnot over the course of 31 seasons and counting. This is the very first episode of the show, way back in 1989. Homer is a nuclear technician here. He works on the floor handling inanimate radioactive rods. And while he only has this for the first two or three episodes out of uh, nearly 700, we actually still see him each week doing this in the opening theme song when he bounces the green rod. And The Simpsons started out as a very grounded portrayal of a working class blue collar family. So it made sense for Homer to start out literally on the floor of a factory. It could have been a nuclear power plant, it could have been a Ford car assembly line, it could have really been any industrial American job. The way it looked, you knew right off the bat, oh, this is the type of guy he is, this is the type of family he has. And in this episode, Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire, Mr. Burns actually removes the Christmas bonuses. He takes away everybody's bonuses. And because this is a very grounded, realistic, working class family, Homer actually doesn't have any money to buy Christmas presents for his kids. So he's forced to take on a second job, and because this is a Christmas special, Homer gets a gig as a mall Santa Claus. Hey Santa, what's shaking, man? What's your name, partner? Now what's very interesting about Homer as a mall Santa is this is already the first second job we see Homer get. As you'll see, a lot of these jobs Homer has in addition to his original job. And we're seeing this kind of American iconic job, the mall Santa, and they pull the curtain back in their very funny subversive way where we can kind of see the inner workings of how this works, the training class. And this is starting a pattern that we'll see for the rest of the series where we don't just get the job, we get the behind the scenes look at the job. And remember, this is the very first episode and the show, its initial roots was a subversive but realistic look at American life. This is, they're still existing in our reality. Now, by episode 700, season 31, Homer might actually become Santa Claus. It hasn't happened yet, but it might happen. But here, it's just a very realistic look at a working class guy in a suit with a fake beard. So this is only the third episode in the series and already Homer gets fired from his job as a nuclear technician. And this is when he decides at this crossroads in his life to devote himself to helping other people, starting with a stop sign at an intersection. And that snowballs into him going around town, just trying to help people and keep them safe. A lot of the jobs he does highlights exactly what kind of man Homer Simpson is. And this safety crusade might really get to the core of who Homer is just three episodes in. And then he targets the biggest threat to Springfield safety, and that's the nuclear power plant. He goes after Mr. Burns, and uh, he does such a good job that Mr. Burns has no choice but to actually hire Homer as a safety inspector. Time's up. Mm, what the hey, I'll take the job. Excellent. And this is where Homer gets the job that he still has to this day, his day job, as a safety inspector for Sector 7G with the very famous console. When Homer gets a full head of hair, he actually gets promoted by Mr. Burns from safety inspector to a high-level executive. He gets access to the executive bathroom, he gets his own assistant, and this kind of showcases now we're only in season two and he's already had three different positions at the power plant and that number will grow. He'll basically have every position at the plant. Now season one, 13 episodes, they already did a very well-rounded job of poking fun a working class life. What they're already starting to do here in season two is poke fun at the higher levels of capitalism. So he gets the job because he has a full head of hair, which shows the superficiality of kind of the corporate executive environment. So many of Homer's jobs that we're gonna cover, he has a rise and fall arc, and this might actually be the first. So he tells this entire story through a flashback at Moe's, and you see him become a mascot for this minor league baseball team, Dancing Homer, where he just has a cape and a t-shirt. And he rises, becomes a huge celebrity, he's transferred to Capital City to play for the majors. I just got the word. You've been called up to Capital City. And he quickly falls. He's no longer a big fish in a small pond. And he ends up back at Moe's, telling the story to the local bar flies. After finding out he has a long-lost half-brother in Detroit who runs this multi-million dollar car company, Homer's offered the chance to design his own car. I want you to help me design a car. A car for all the Homer Simpsons out there. He designs the Homer, this $80,000 monstrosity that has a bunch of ridiculous ideas that ends up costing his brother his entire company. 
And by this point in the series, even though it's early on, they've already established Homer as pretty much a buffoon, an idiot. So uh, this is one of many cases where Homer bites off more than he can chew. Now, season three, this is the beginning of the classic era of Simpsons, and this is where Homer picking up a second job on top of his existing job really starts to ramp up. In this case, he's getting a second job to pay for Lisa's happiness. He buys her a pony in a stable, and he has to work two jobs with very little room for sleep in between. Pink Cat, when I ordered that blueberry squishy, I meant today. Coming right up, sir. And this job is a classic example of Homer just having a huge heart. The sacrifices he makes for his family, in this case for Lisa, he's not just getting a second job, he's basically working 24 hours a day and nearly getting himself killed, falling asleep at the wheel. And this just shows Homer, for all his faults, he loves his family more than anything. Hey, Mo, you got any cough syrup? Uh, let me check the lost and found. So Homer shows a knack for inventing throughout the series, and it probably begins here when he designs his own cocktail, the Flaming Mo, just using things in his kitchen. The secret ingredient is children's cough syrup. Homer, you turned the blades too fast. So a lot of Homer's jobs aren't actually concurrent with his time at the power plant. We see them in flashback form. I Married Marge takes place in 1980. Homer is working at a mini golf course when they conceive Bart in a, in a windmill on one of the holes. Maybe it's the champagne talking, but I think you're pretty sexy. Really? It must be the champagne talking. Mm. And after they conceive Bart and they need to get married, Homer takes on a bunch of other jobs to help pay the bills. This includes being a trainer at the Pitless Pup Attack Dog School, a candle maker at the Ye Old Candle Maker Shop, knife salesman for Slash Co., and an employee at the Gulp and Blow. He works the drive through and this is actually where he reproposes to Marge using an onion ring as an engagement ring. Now, this is one of the more famous episodes of The Simpsons' early years, and while it's a work league and it's not exactly a, a paid job, because Homer is playing along baseball greats like Daryl Strawberry and Ken Griffey Jr., we're gonna go ahead and consider this a job. Now, Homer at the Bat is, uh, is a very important episode in the series because it might be the first that has a slew of celebrity guest stars as themselves, and this is something that's gonna happen a lot more as we go on. These guys aren't so tough. I've got Wonder Bat. And this kind of changes the nature, not only of the show, but of Homer's relationship to the real world. Most of us don't get to play baseball with Daryl Strawberry, but Homer's gonna end up playing a lot of different sports with a lot of different famous athletes. Oh, the bases were After discovering a beautiful and talented country singer named Lurleen Lumpkin, Homer actually signs on to be her manager slash agent, uh, making her famous overnight. I want you to be my manager. Really? Homer gives up this sweet gig after realizing that it might cost him his marriage with Marge. And this is one of many cases where Homer has to choose between his job and his family. Sometimes he gets a job that he truly loves doing, but it's gonna cost him his family, and at the end of the day, Homer always goes with his family. Up until now, nearly every job Homer's had is within the realm of possibilities for the character of Homer Simpson. Uh, even when he's dancing Homer, he's basically just getting drunk and, and, and dancing in front of a bunch of people. This showcases a skill set that is kind of turning Homer into this renaissance man savant. We didn't know up until this point that he could be a country music manager. And we'll start to see this more and more where Homer's doing a job you would have never expected him to do in season one. Homer finds local success as a plow truck driver. When he crashes both of his cars and needs to buy a new vehicle, he ends up buying a plow truck and tries to make his money back by plowing the streets of Springfield until he loses his job to his best friend Barney and to God. Mr. Plow is interesting because this is the first time Homer really starts his own small business as opposed to uh, getting a job somewhere else or being a, a manager. And this is the American dream, to open up your own small business. Homer tries out and is arbitrarily selected to be the conductor for Springfield's new monorail. Well, I've been monitoring your progress closely, but this gentleman here clearly stands out above the rest. Who, me? Yeah, sure. Woohoo! And this is interesting because this is one of the first big epic plots where Springfield is in danger and Homer actually saves a day by anchoring the monorail before it runs off track. Donuts. Is there anything they can't do? Hey, what does this job pay? Union leader. This is interesting because it actually ties way back into Homer's Odyssey, where Homer wants to protect his fellow workers and fellow townspeople as safety inspector. And in this case, he's trying to protect their dental plan. 
Uh, and I don't know what gets more American than trying to protect your dental plan. And this is considered one of the all-time best episodes of the show, not only because there's maybe a joke every four seconds. Why must you turn my office into a house of lies? But it's a David versus Goliath story. It's, it's Homer taking on Mr. Burns, just like he did in Homer's Odyssey, but now the show is really firing on all cylinders. This is season four. The characters are really defined. And Homer steps up, not just for himself, but uh, selflessly for the other townspeople. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney Island. Goodbye, my Coney This is another 15 Minutes of Fame episode, and this was the season five premiere. And this is really taking it to the nth degree. Homer literally becomes bigger than Jesus, bigger than the Beatles. What'd you do? Screw up like the Beatles and say you were bigger than Jesus? All the time. It was the title of our second album. We've seen Homer care about other people, and we've seen him start to invent things and be creative, but he also has this knack for artistry and entertaining when it comes to acting, and especially when it comes to music. This is not the first band Homer will be a part of that becomes internationally famous. And season five is where the show really starts taking off with these larger than life plots. We start to break out of Springfield and Homer's internationally famous. He's not just a mall Santa, he's famous around the world. He even wins a Grammy. 21? Do that card counting thing again. Homer becomes a well-liked blackjack dealer at Mr. Burns' casino, mainly because he's not very good at it and everybody wins. Homer leads a vigilante group when a cat burglar starts striking around town. And this is interesting because it kind of ties into this larger American machismo archetype. Homer needs to go around and bust heads. But it's also, it ties into his character because he's very protective of his family. When Lisa gets his saxophone stolen, uh, it really shakes him and this is why he ends up forming a vigilante group. Hello everybody, I'm Archie Bell and I'm also the Drell. Bart gets famous, but uh, we see in a flashback that uh, one of his very first jobs was a street musician. And this ties into what we were saying about the B-sharps. Homer does have this innate musical talent. He's been in multiple bands, and in this case, he's the entire band. A lot of earlier fans thought Deep Space Homer was when the show really just broke away from what it used to be. Are we there yet? I'm thirsty. Ugh. Mission Control, request permission to sedate cargo ahead of schedule. Homer is sent to space as a working class astronaut to boost NASA ratings and ends up averting disaster. He almost crashes a space shuttle that has Buzz Aldrin in it. It's a very funny classic episode, but the idea of Homer Simpson going to space is something that would have seemed ridiculous in season one. And Matt Groening, uh, the creator of The Simpsons, talks about a rubber band reality, how far the show can actually stretch the reality of The Simpsons. And at this point in season five, they really wanted to see if they could get away with sending Homer to space. And as we'll see by season 31, the rubber band could actually be stretched a lot farther than that. But what makes this episode work is that while the setting is kind of ridiculous and they are stretching that rubber band literally to outer orbit, Homer is still the same character we know from season one, season two, season three. We're just seeing him in this other set of ridiculous circumstances. Homer serves on a jury for Freddie Quimby's murder trial, and he's actually the only one of the 12 that wants to vote to acquit him, mainly because of all the uh, deluxe accommodations you get when you're sequestered. Uh, how are the rest of you voting? Guilty. Guilty. Okay, fine. How many S's in innocent? <laughs> Homer gets a job at the adult education annex giving tips on a successful marriage, which is ironic because the job basically devolves into him gossiping about Marge and almost ends in a divorce. Now this is a storyline where Homer's selfishness, not his selflessness, is, drives the plot and, you know, Homer can sometimes be a real jerk. That's kind of why we love him, but this one really, really tests just how far can Homer go without breaking his marriage, which is one of the core spines of the show. After finding a truckload of raw sugar, as one does, Homer tries to profit by selling it as much as he can, even door to door. This is one of many get-rich-quick schemes that we're gonna start to see as the show moves on. If taking on a second job or a night job is a facet of America that the show likes to cover, so is the get-rich-quick scheme. First you get the sugar, then you get the power, then you get the women. What's the matter with you, Homer? We don't have any fruits or vegetables in the car. <laughs> Old trucks full of a march. On their long drive to Itchy and Scratchy Land, Homer gets pulled over and caught smuggling illegally, presumably, uh, some fruits and vegetables. This is interesting because not only is it the first time Homer's gonna smuggle something, but it's also the first time he's really doing anything illicit. And we'll see a handful of the jobs we're gonna cover are either gray market or black market gigs. Sir, uh, hello, sir. Homer and Grandpa become old school traveling salesmen for a tonic that Grandpa devises that is, uh, it's basically a forerunner for Viagra. 
I'm gonna make it after all. This is a dream job of Homer's, uh, but he only holds it briefly. He leaves the nuclear power plant once the family is financially sound, but when Maggie is conceived and they're gonna have a third child, Homer again sacrifices for his family by giving up his dream job to go work back at the power plant. Homer will always choose his family over his own happiness. And because Homer actually quits the power plant and uh, is forced to beg for his job back, Mr. Burns cruelly makes him put up this sign. Don't forget, you're here forever. And in one of the most heartwarming moments in the series history, Homer covers that sign up with pictures of Maggie so that the only letters left spell, do it for her. And if that's not America for you, working to put food on your family's table, I don't know what is, that, that is The Simpsons. <laughs> Convinced by a new billboard to go to clown college, Homer becomes a crusty impersonator until the mob almost kills him because they think he's the real deal. I'm seeing double here. Four crusties. To make up for a debt to his hated sister-in-laws, Homer needs another second job, and in this case, he becomes a chauffeur for Classy Joe's. One of his clients is Mel Brooks. It's very funny. Hey, let's do that 2,000-pound man thing. I'll be that Carl Reiner guy, and you'll be what's his face. What? The ball? It's Homer is put on the jury for Springfield's first film festival and becomes the deciding vote between Barney's art house masterpiece and Mr. Burns' bombastic ego trip, as well as Hans Moleman's football in the groin. A Star is Burns is, uh, it's one of my favorite episodes. It's actually a crossover with uh, another brilliant animated show, The Critic, starring John Lovitz as Jay Sherman. Now, while I love this episode, Matt Groening was actually against it from the very start and still isn't crazy about it because he thought doing a crossover with another show was beneath The Simpsons. And this was the first time The Simpsons really had ever done that. And if you ever want to visit my show... Nah, we're not gonna be doing that. But like other far-fetched plots that the show has done, if they can do it funny and they can do it true to the characters, why not? This is one of those quick gags, blink and you miss it, but basically Homer invites his old sergeant to dinner, and when the dinner party is ruined by all the new puppies that the Simpsons have, Homer's basically recalled back into the army. Simpson! See you at Reveille! Oh, 0500 tomorrow! And this is really the first time it's implied Homer ever had a, any background in the armed forces, but as we'll see, uh, it's not the last. Head of a detective agency. This one's not really shown, but it's mentioned by Marge. It's a quick one-off gag. Your father can be surprisingly sensitive. Remember when I giggled at a Sherlock Holmes hat? He sulked for a week and then closed his detective agency. Hear ye, hear ye! The Homer Broadcasting System is on the air! This one kind of starts off as a joke because uh, Homer's perfect for a town crier. He's loud, he's boisterous, but it ends up tying very neatly into the plot when he uses his gig to help Lisa expose the town's history. Did you get that report on the accounting department? When Smithers finally goes on vacation, he picks Homer to take his job, basically because Homer's the last person he would ever expect Mr. Burns to like more than him. I told you I don't like ethnic food. So Homer actually gets his job because he's the most incompetent employee at the power plant. Smithers basically doesn't want anybody to outshine him at his own job. And Homer does do such a bad job that Mr. Burns actually becomes self-sufficient. Homer's knack for taking cannonballs to the gut gets him a job as a freak at Hullabalooza, which is a big 90s festival that has Smashing Pumpkins and Cypress Hill. And it's one of these second job plots where Homer briefly becomes famous and it's tied into his love for uh, the entertainment industry. And it basically comes down to it's literally killing him and he has to quit before it does. This episode's interesting because it, it starts off grounded. Homer gets this job that's not too dissimilar from his own. Basically, he's headhunted because he's the most senior member at the power plant. But it gradually turns into this ridiculous James Bond spectacle. His boss is literally a supervillain named Hank Scorpio, who takes over the East Coast by the end of the episode. And we're seeing it from Homer's perspective where he's clueless. He doesn't even realize what's going on. He's just there to collect a paycheck. And this is yet another example of Homer giving up a dream job for his family. He loves working for Scorpio because it's just a great gig. He doesn't know about the Bond stuff. Uh, he's just very happy in Cypress Creek, but the rest of the family isn't. He gives up the job. It's Again, it comes down to his happiness versus his family's happiness. And they, they go back to Springfield. And because Homer actually succeeds in helping Scorpio build a doomsday machine and take over the East Coast, he's rewarded with his dream job, which was to be an owner of a football team. It's not the Dallas Cowboys, but it's a start. Drop me a line if you're on the East Coast, Hank Scorpio. Unfortunately, the football team turns out to be the Denver Broncos, which at the time was not a very good get. 
Homer's genetically abnormal skull allows him to take a lot of severe head trauma. So Mo puts him in the boxing ring and he becomes this great boxer, at least until he has to go against the champ, Dredrick Tatum, who pretty much nearly kills him in one blow. And this is one of those jobs where it's not Homer giving it up because his family's unhappy. He's giving it up because it's literally gonna kill him. It automatically calls them one by one and plays my message. This is one of those get rich quick schemes for Homer. He finds this auto dialer and uses it to his advantage by calling every phone number in Springfield and asking for a one dollar to happy do. I don't get to be a cartoon dog. Homer becomes a voiceover actor for the Itchy and Scratchy show playing Poochie, the new hip 90s dog, which everybody immediately hates. Hey kids, always recycle. To the extreme! This is the first acting gig that Homer gets, and we're gonna see him get a bunch more, even in the voiceover field. But Homer, in addition to having a knack for inventing and a knack for music, apparently Homer's also really good at acting. Well, not that good, because they, they immediately want to kill Poochie off. Homer takes advantage of Springfield's prohibition by becoming its chief bootlegger. He becomes known as the Beer Baron, and he supplies the town with illegal booze. We've seen Homer smuggle some things before, but this is the most illegal thing he's done by far. Uh, he's basically the chief bootlegger in a town. He even becomes the target of Rex Banner, who is Springfield's Elliot Ness. You're out there somewhere, Beer Baron, and I'll find you. No, you won't. Come along and join the family. This is where the show really starts to experiment and get meta. In this case, we get three vignettes, possible spin-offs that the show can do, and one of them is a variety-style show where the Simpsons play themselves, but entertainer versions of themselves. Basically, the Simpsons in quotes. And it's not the last time they're gonna do this. This is one of the first times the show has actually acknowledged that it is a show, and it really is quite meta. They get away with it again, because now, after eight seasons, they've done such a good job drawing and writing their characters and writing the town of Springfield that we are so familiar with these characters that they can now play with them. And they were already doing this a bit with the Treehouse of Horror Halloween episodes, but this is a very, very meta take where the show is a show, but the characters are playing themselves. And it's a very fine line because an audience could get lost, but the writers were counting on the fact that The Simpsons by now is just a part of Americana and they can kind of take place almost in our world. Homer replaces Flanders as the coach for Bart's team after heckling him from the stands. Flanders! What? Flanders! It's almost surprising it took nine seasons, but Homer finally becomes a carny working at a carnival. I got a few complaints that your game is crooked. <laughs> and ho. Oh. Homer's working unpaid here as a member of a cult, uh, but it's a lot of actual labor. He's working in the fields and other menial jobs for the cult, so this certainly counts as a job. While most of the jobs we've covered uh, is the show taking its aim at slices of Americana and American culture, this is them going after something a little bit more specific. They're basically using the power of satire to take down Scientology. Homer sets up his own small business, in which he gives himself the title of Junior Vice President. And this episode is really a great look at what America's view of this internet thing was in the late 90s. Welcome to the internet, my friend. How can I help you? I'm interested in upgrading my 28.8 kilobaud internet connection to a 1.5 megabit fiber optic T1 line. Will you be able to provide an IP router that's compatible with my token ring ethernet LAN configuration? While this might seem like ancient history, this is actually taking place in the height of the dot-com boom in the late 90s. This is where people like me were just finding out what internet even was. We knew it had something to do with computers, but we didn't know what it was. And we've come a long way since then. Uh, you're watching this on a computer or a smart TV. I'm recording it on a phone, which is insane. Also, this story is very much of its time because it takes place during the dot-com boom. And like The Simpsons often does, it kind of predicted both the bust and the corporate takeover of smaller companies when Bill Gates takes over the competition. Homer becomes a Navy reservist and serves on a submarine and eventually becomes its captain. People's lives are depending on me. Mr. Sulu, make a left. Aye, aye, Captain. Setting course for Rigel 7. I mean home. <laughs> this is the first time we actually see Homer in the line of duty. And of course, it's just a simple war games exercise that he nearly starts World War III. They want you to spy on your friends? After cheating on his taxes, Homer is actually recruited by the FBI to be an informant to rat out Mr. Burns. And this is not the last time this is going to happen. 
Homer runs for and wins the job of Springfield Sanitation Commissioner. Woohoo! Aren't you gonna buy it, Dad? 50 cents? <laughs> Not likely. In this capacity, Homer actually blows the budget of the department so badly that the entire town needs to relocate several miles away from its own trash. Homer is sponsored by Power Sauce to climb Springfield's tallest mountain, the Murder Horn. Grease Collector. This is another get-rich-quick scheme by Homer, where basically he goes around town with Bart collecting grease to sell it. That comes to... 63 cents. Woohoo! We've seen glimpses of this before, but this is where Homer really shines as an inventor. He has a passion for just building and creating things. And in this episode, Thomas Edison becomes his role model, and Homer strives to be the next great American inventor. Close your eyes, Marge. And now you're ready for a night on the town. <gasps> Tell me over breakfast, who's for pancakes? Homer becomes a personal assistant, and this episode is The Simpsons at its best, lampooning Hollywood culture. Wow, you got everything, Homer. Even the Oscar polish. This job ends, as so many of ours do, by nearly killing Ron Howard. Season 10's a very pivotal time for The Simpsons. It's where the show is no longer this upstart countercultural thing, but it is the culture. The Simpsons is Hollywood culture, and its relationship to celebrities changed. They're now not just doing voiceovers, they're playing themselves, and kind of The Simpsons, the show, and The Simpsons, the family, have literally become friends with the celebrities. Very often when we do these Homer Gets Another Job episodes, there's a lot of jokes based on Homer using his newfound set of skills uh, outside of the job in everyday life. So there's some great moments here where Homer learns a neck pinch that will make you pass out and he uses it so that he can pass out so he doesn't have to wait for dinner. Homer starts and ends his job the same way, protecting Mark Hamill. Homer starts a war with the trucking industry when he becomes a trucker himself and discovers their secret plot, self-driving trucks. You stumbled on a secret that only truck drivers are supposed to know. This is one of those cases where the show uh, seems to predict the future with an eerie sense of accuracy. When this came out, a lot of people thought it was a jump the shark moment because the idea of trucks driving themselves across the country was completely ridiculous. And now it may very well be the future. Homer becomes a railroad engineer, presumably at the end of the episode, when he and Bart are stranded and need a way back to Springfield, and it's implied that they end up taking a train full of napalm back to town. Homer's rage actually leads to him becoming an outsider artist. His masterpiece? Flood Springfield and turn it to the next Venice. So this is art, not vandalism? That's for the courts to decide, son. Hello, little girl. This is another get-rich-quick scheme for Homer. Basically, he comes into a bunch of springs and needs to get rid of them. And when he designs this Olympic mascot made out of the springs, it shows both Homer's latent inventing and artistic skills that we see across the board with a bunch of jobs. Yippee! Time for the company loyalty song! When the family gets stranded in Japan, Homer and the rest of the Simpsons have to work at a fish gutting factory. Homer is hired by Mel Gibson to rework his film, and this is the first of several times Homer is going to be working on Hollywood films. The other critics told me to be mean, and you should always give in to peer pressure. This job utilizes Homer's love of food, something that has been well established by this season. Homer becomes a farmer, and when he does a poor job, he improvises and uses plutonium and ends up creating a tomaco, a tomato-tobacco hybrid that, uh, because of its addictive qualities, sells very well. On the run from the mob, Homer becomes a missionary in the South Pacific. You two haven't said a word. I like that. You're hired. Homer's on the run from a Florida sheriff and uh, gets a job as a short order cook in this off-road diner. You might notice now the jobs are less second jobs for extra income and more jobs out of necessity, uh, either because he's on the run or being run out of town. A lot of these jobs Homer really doesn't need or is set up by ridiculous circumstances. My funny family, take one. This is the meta of all meta episodes. This is where the Simpsons really do play, quote unquote, the Simpsons. They're themselves, they're a family that lives in 742 Evergreen Terrace, but they're also a very famous American TV show. In this episode, Homer writes, directs, and stars in The Simpsons that is watched by millions across America. Homer and I had real chemistry on screen. Every day I thought about firing Marge. 
you know, just to shake things up. This is the season finale for season 11. And in 11 seasons, we've now seen the show start as this grounded blue collar show about a family and uh, literally becoming this meta show within a show within a show. They're breaking the fourth wall. They're breaking the fifth wall. At this point, it's more like a tesseract of walls and they're smashing every single one of them. Loyal citizens of New Springfield. When Springfield is split into two towns by area code, Homer actually becomes mayor of New Springfield. Let's see how old Snubfield does without electricity. Woohoo! Mr. Burns pays Homer to become his prank monkey, basically going around town, humiliating himself or pulling pranks on other people, specifically just for Mr. Burns' amusement. Uh, and this is one of the first jobs we've seen that is a completely made up job. We're in season 12 now, Homer needs to do something, so why not have him throw pudding in Lenny's eye? Ow, my eye! I'm not supposed to get pudding in it! I'll just call myself Mr. X. All right, this might seem crazy, but back when this episode aired, there wasn't that many online conspiracy theorists. Homer was one of the first as Mr. X. This precursor to online flat earthers and other conspiracy theorists, Homer basically becomes famous online by making these ridiculous outlandish conspiracy theories until he's detained by a mysterious organization because one of them turns out to be true. Homer and Bart become grifters, conning people around town out of money until uh, the town teaches them a lesson. This is around the time where Homer takes on these personalities a lot of people call jerk-ass Homer. He's literally taking hard-earned money out of other people's pockets. We start to see this more and more often as the show reaches these uh, seasons in the teens and 20s. Who's gonna buy a pill that makes you blind? Barney Gumble suggests that Homer gets a job at a medical testing center to earn a quick buck. It's there that they discover Homer actually lodged a crayon into his brain when he was young. When they remove the crayon, Homer becomes brilliant. I was working on a flat tax proposal and I accidentally proved there's no God. We'll just see about that. Uh-oh. Homer then gives a guest lecture at Springfield Elementary on not putting things up your nose. Wondering if I could... Homer starts operating a chiropractor's office out of his own garage after a trash can he damaged seems to miraculously fix people's backs. This one's one of those B stories that kind of just exists to fill some pages, and it ends as quickly as it begins where the real chiropractors take Homer out. Homer creates his own baby-proofing industry when he realizes he'll save a lot of money by doing it himself. And he becomes so good at his job coming up with ways to protect young children that he actually affects the pediatrics industry. The dream is over. Just a few episodes later, stuck at home with a torn ACL, Homer creates Uncle Homer's Daycare Center, where he babysits uh, his friends and other people around town's children. I'd like to speak to a Mr. Tabooger. First name, Ollie. Oh, Bart! My first prank call! What do I do? Just ask. Homer first fills in for Mo at Mo's Tavern. I don't get it. And then when Mo rebrands as a swanky nightclub, Homer opens up his own bar in the garage. At this point in the show's evolution, uh, you can even start to see the writing and the style of the show change, and the episodes become less character-based and less morality plays, and more plot devices and, and basically just factories for jokes and gags. And that includes Homer's jobs. A lot of Homer's jobs fill the role of just quick B-plots or one-off gags or just time fillers for a laugh. So it, you'll actually start to notice that the jobs are less important for the story and uh, you can almost just rattle them off like you would a joke. You will take a short sea voyage. Yeah. Enjoy that! After complaining their fortunes and the fortune cookies are unimaginative, Homer's actually hired by a restaurant to write their fortunes. This episode kind of combines when Homer was selling sugar and the one where he's smuggling and bootlegging alcohol. When Springfield puts a ban on sugar, Homer actually starts to smuggle sugar into town. Believing Marge has left him for his old rival Artie Ziff, Homer runs away and gets a new job as an oil rigger in West Springfield. Homer is promoted by Mr. Burns to vice president basically because he just laughs at all of his jokes. Working hard or hardly working? <laughs> uh, what Burns doesn't know is Homer is completely stoned on medical marijuana. Homer is sentenced to community service and is forced to become a Meals on Wheels driver. Meals on Wheels? Eat it up or I go to jail. One of his Meals on Wheels clients actually guilts him and Marge into becoming her servants. 
During a crime wave, Homer creates Spring Shield, a private security firm. I hereby turn over all this town's police duties to Homer Simpson and Spring Shield. Woohoo! The mayor then promotes him to chief of police, where he replaces Wiggum uh, up until the mob almost kills him. Do test, do test for, you test me like the water in El Salvador. In another celebrity guest star heavy episode, Homer becomes a roadie for several iconic rock stars when they do a benefit concert. Homer agrees to this gig to help pay off Bart, and it's kind of perfect for him because, if you remember, he and his dad were actually selling their own homemade Viagra years before the real product was on the market. It gives you lots of hair and what you need down there. After finding out that technically a canary is the CEO of the power plant, Homer blackmails Mr. Burns into giving him the job. Now I need to find a patsy. Hello. You, you're quite the friendly fellow, but right now I'm looking for a patsy. Hello? When he becomes his own boss and becomes a CEO, he spends less time with his family, and when he finds himself missing them, he actually gives the job up. And this goes back to old school Homer, where Homer will choose his family over his job. And while a lot of the episodes at this point in the show get very wacky and off base, every once in a while the show will remind us who the original Homer Simpson is, and they'll show us the old, grounded Homer who will always put his family first. I'd like to see his house go up in flames. Homer writes a song with David Byrne called Everybody Hates Ned Flanders that becomes wildly popular. This episode once again shows Homer has this innate ability to write pop songs. He writes hits. If you despise polite left-handers, then I doubt you'll like Ned Flanders. Homer quite literally becomes death and starts reaping souls around Springfield. Pardon me, coming through, rest in peace, you're dead, take it or nip. And when God asks him to kill Marge, this is when he puts his foot down and quits. After Homer does such a good job replacing Krusty on the Sabbath, he's given his own talk show and becomes very popular. Lisa then convinces him to use his power for good and talk about social issues, which quickly, of course, makes him lose all his ratings. This show stinks! Now you might notice this isn't the first time Homer has literally replaced Krusty, and that actually has its origins way back in uh, the beginning of the show. If you notice, Krusty looks exactly like Homer, with just a few changes of color and hair and nose. And that is because Matt Groening's original intent was for Crest the Clown to secretly be Homer's alter ego, the joke being that Bart's idol was actually his father. Much like the Mr. Plow storyline, Homer crashes his car and needs to buy a new one, and in this case he buys a 1950s style ambulance, and since he has it, he just becomes a paramedic. It's that easy. Homer actually becomes a car salesman first. He needs the job after he gets fired. Let's get out of here. I'm not shaking that guy's hand. I'll be back. and it's there that he buys the ambulance basically from himself. I think this guy's coming on to me. Bojack! Homer actually wins Artie Ziff's company while they're playing poker, but this was all part of Artie's plan because the SEC was actually after him. So when Homer becomes CEO, Homer gets arrested for securities fraud. When Bart goes to Juvenile Hall, Homer actually gets a job as a guard so that he can keep a better eye on him and protect him. Of course, this just makes Bart a bigger target. Superhero. This episode aired right at the dawn of the superhero trend in Hollywood, the big blockbuster superhero movies, and this one takes its cues from Spider-Man. Homer becomes Pie Man, where he throws pies in people's faces, and they even recreate the iconic upside-down kiss with Marge. Prescription Drug Smuggler Homer smuggles prescription drugs from Canada after Mr. Burns and other town employers take away everybody's health insurance. This is the first time in a while we've seen Homer take on a job that harkens way back to the beginning when he was uh, looking out for the greater good and the good of his fellow man. Which describes you, sir? Homer becomes a professional victory dance choreographer here for celebrities including Tom Brady and Michelle Kwan, and he's actually asked to do the Super Bowl halftime show. At last, my pathetic little life has a meaning. <laughs> you suckers! I would have done it for free! Fine, do it for free! Damn it! He doesn't really know what to do, so he teams up with Ned and makes a Christian themed show, which immediately gets booed by everybody. Ordained Minister. When Reverend Lovejoy refuses to marry a same sex couple, Homer seizes the opportunity and gets ordained from the online Episcopal Church, charging gay couples $200 to marry them. This episode once again shows how The Simpsons is always a reflection of current attitudes in America. So in season 8, there's an episode called Homer's Phobia, where Homer is uh, homophobic. Homer, what have you got against gays? You know, it, it's not 
usual. Here it shows not just how far Homer has come, but how far America has come in terms of accepting LGBTQ plus couples. Welcome to Sprawl Mart. Simple cream and I Sprawl Mart greeter. So Homer defending the rights of his fellow underpaid greeters it shows again Homer is kind of a working class hero. Homer, would you be interested in the position of executive greeter? Woohoo! That's been my dream ever since I heard it existed right now. What do I get? You get to work overtime without us paying you extra. I won't do it. If you don't, we'll ship you right back to Mexico. The Simpsons Index coined the term parallel import for when the show decides to use their own knockoff brand rather than mention a real company or product. So this use of parallel imports, the reason I want to mention it is because it's very common throughout the show, especially in the later seasons. Why they do it? Uh, is it because it's just they have a lot of fun writing stupid puns? They want to avoid lawsuits? One good reason is they probably can use a fictional company, a fictional name to represent not just a specific company, but larger societal ills. Homer pretends to be his sister-in-law Selma's husband to help her adopt a child in China. And as part of the ruse, Homer says he's an acrobat. When they put him to the test, he actually has to go on stage and perform acrobatics. <laughs> Homer becomes a composer and manager for Lisa as she competes on Lil Star Maker, which is the show's parallel import of American Idol. He then becomes the manager for her rival, Cameron, who he rebrands as Johnny Rainbow. Homer becomes a competitive arm wrestler when he faces opponents such as Lefty, the Righty, Left Right. Look, folks, it's season 17. Homer's gonna arm wrestle. It's just, it's, it's where we are now. Tip 99. Oh, Safety oh, Salamander. Homer becomes a costume mascot that teaches children to avoid down power lines which uh, is a very important lesson to learn. After rescuing people from a car accident in his salamander costume, Homer is pushed to run against Mayor Quimby in a recall election. Remember, he was once mayor of New Springfield. He's also Mayor Quimby's bodyguard, so he's danced around this position before, but he's never quite run for mayor. He actually loses the election when people see him out of costume, though. At this point in the show, we're in season 17, the country itself has become much more polarized. It resembles where we are now with the right versus the left. Even though the show has always touched on politics and Homer's always kind of been an outsider and never really a specific Republican or Democrat, you'll start to see the show itself become a little bit more political just because it's representing a country that has become more political. So it's interesting to see this is where Homer runs for mayor. This is really where we start going from general to specifics, at least when it comes to politics. Human advertisement. Homer starts wearing advertisements on his physical body to help sell blue pants for the company that makes his pants, basically so that they can stay in business and keep making the pants he likes. This is probably a specific reference to around this time there was a kid walking around college with advertisements tattooed on his face, and the show was always quick to point out kind of weird, crazy things like that. Uh... Homer becomes manager of the power plant when it's outsourced to India. When Homer treats his employees well, Burns is infuriated and moves the plant back to Springfield. This is another one of those issue episodes where the Simpsons writers take on outsourcing. Yellow. Dad, I gotta write a report on the Great Lakes. Just outsource it to Lisa. Outsourcing is the answer to everything. Homer, please. <laughs> marriage counselor. A famous baseball player and his pop star wife ask Homer and Marge to be their marriage counselors. Wow, I think we really hit on something here. Unfortunately, we're out of time. This probably isn't the best idea because Homer's done this before at the adult education annex and it nearly cost him his marriage. And that was part one of each and every job Homer has had on The Simpsons. We've got a lot more, so please stick around and stay tuned for part two.